Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the April 12th Combined Planning and Voting Meeting of the Pine Richland School Board. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Ms. Williams. Mr. Lyons? Here. Mrs. Misbach? Here. Mr. Kashani? Here. Dr. Campbell? Here. Mr. DiTulio? Dr. Mihalik? Here. Dr. Meyer? Here. Mr. Moy? Here. Mrs. Swope? Here. Thank you. Thank you. As has been our practice, we'll have Dr. Miller give an update on the COVID-19 educational model at this time. Just to mention, too, that the board met in executive session prior to the it's been mentioned. meeting. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Ms. Williams. Okay, good evening. Uh, tonight's presentation will again be turned into a podcast. I'm going to move at a rather quick pace this evening uh, to address some of the slides that people are familiar with and also to raise a few new points. Uh, so here's our uh, game plan for the evening. And I'll mention the third bullet. It's really exciting. It, it has been wonderful to see over the last about four weeks the increase in students on campus. Over this past week, we've seen that increase at the secondary level and you feel some of that energy that comes. It's almost like the first day of school, but not quite the first day of school. And really proud of the way that the students have embraced the responsibilities they have, the way that staff is working together. Things like lunch are a big deal when you significantly increase the number of students on a, in a campus. And so we're, we're really uh, proud of the effort as a part of the transition plan. We've talked about this continuum many times and all year long it has been a continuum. And so anytime we have moved in one direction, we have immediately talked about what might it mean to move in a different direction because that's the challenge we face is understanding when and how and where might we meet, need to move left or right on the continuum. And in the bottom we can see conditions and cases have worsened over the last few weeks. We are seeing that. And as we shifted left on the continuum, and as conditions and cases have worsened, that has implications. And we're going to talk about that uh, this evening. This is a snapshot from today from Allegheny County Health Department's dashboard. In the upper left, again, we can see sort of that increasing over the last few weeks of cases. In the upper right, we can see that the positivity rate for testing is now above eight. So again, uh, those, those graphs, which are updated weekly, demonstrate what we've been seeing uh, in terms of the amount of virus that's in the community. This slide and the next slide are now updated every weekday. So at some point in the afternoon every day, we are updating this on the Pine Richland website. So any staff member, any community member, any student who would like to see the daily update can do so in the afternoon uh, and understand you know, what, what is changing and to what degree. If we look at March and April, we can see a couple of things. We see the cases increasing. So what that tells us is Pine Richland is part of the community. And when the community sees something like increases, we see something like increases. The other thing that's, that's really, um, I would say, significant for April is we see that student number at 15 and staff number at 1. And this also reflects what's being seen nationally and in the state, which is they're seeing cases increase among school age and, and college age students. So we're seeing that as well. Again, that just reinforces um, that we are a part of the community and the community is a part of us. We see the breakdown by school. This slide uh, reflects the number of cases in the 14 day window. And so I wanna draw your attention to a couple of things. So first, let's look at the Pine Richland High School as an example. The clock starts when there is a case where the student or staff member was in school or at a school-related activity during their period of infection, so when they were sick or when they were symptomatic or the two days prior to becoming symptomatic. That's what starts the window. And then it lasts for 14 days. So at the high school, we have a student who was positive, and that started the 14-day the rolling window. 
The column on the far right is new, and that column we will now update on a daily basis as a part of our website. And that shows the number of students or staff, mostly that would be students, who are quarantined for 10 days because they were identified as a close contact based upon school, based upon school. That could be a school activity or that could be the academic day that will not reflect a student who's quarantined, let's say because their sibling is confirmed positive or because their parent is confirmed positive. But that would be a school-based quarantine. So we can see at the middle school, two cases in the window, 13 students quarantine, Eden Hall, one case in the window, uh, six students. The windows will eventually vary by individual school. And so a lot of the things we're looking at now will be school by school, understanding what's going on and then making decisions based upon that. In the action threshold, and that's the action threshold for possible closure, there's an asterisk, and I would just ask people to pause the, the podcast and to look at the information listed there. It's on our website, and it helps clarify why or how decisions are made. And again, we consult with Allegheny County Health Department. We shared this a few months ago. Visually, it just is another way of thinking about the window because we do get questions about this. People do not understand necessarily how, to, how does that happen. So this is a fictitious example on day one, identified three cases. Those are indicated in gray. That starts the clock. So you can see those the gray bars go all the way across to day 14. That's the 14-day rolling window. As cases are added during that window, we see their sort of 14-day stretch. So as soon as we get to day 15, those three gray cases disappear from the 14-day rolling window. The date range changes, so now it would be day 2 to 15, if you will, and the numbers adjust accordingly. So this is what's happening as students or staff are moving inside or outside of the 14-day um, the window. Pennsylvania Department of Ed, two updates. These are two different updates, but on the same slide. On the left, we can see that we're now in substantial transmission. However, Pennsylvania Department of Education identified blended learning model as a part of now choices within that area. So that's, that's sort of a change when you see the recommended instructional model. On the right side of this slide, we are very fortunate and we cannot say enough of thanks for the responsiveness of Allegheny County Health Department officials to supporting our needs as a school district and working with us every day. It is remarkable knowing what they're doing and how their staffing capacity and capability has changed over time but they are right here with us providing support uh, and advice based upon cases. And that gives us, Pine Richland, and us, Allegheny County School Districts, a, deg a degree of discretion that many parts of the state do not have because they all feed into the overarching Pennsylvania Department of Education. So we're very fortunate uh, to have the support that we have. This was our timeline. Again, as this timeline has been implemented, we've seen an increase in conditions and cases, but last week we brought back, if you will, the last set of students who had desired an increase or change in their instructional model. We shared this last month, but I want to mention it again. On the left margin, left side of the slide, we see how the number of actual students physically present in the building has changed based upon the most recent selection. So, for example, at Eaton Hall, we went from about 450 students coming into the building every day to about 780 students coming into the building every day. Middle school, 325 to 590. High school, 630 to 1,050. So what's indicated in uh, the, the percentages there is what kind of uh, occupancy, for lack of a better word, that reflects. So typically, we're used to about 1,500 students at our high school. And so that 1,050 represents about 72% of what we would normally expect to have physically in person in the school. So when we think about that sort of blended kind of model, we're seeing we have 20 to 30% less students physically present every day, even right now uh, where we are in the continuum. And so again, important to understand, 
But what this also means with the increase in students, as we've talked about, there is a decrease in some of the physical distancing. And this has led to uh, some, some questions. And we have on this slide the question most frequently asked. And that is, people hear and, and understand the headlines around the CDC and other agencies said, okay, three to six feet is fine. And that's what was heard. And three to six feet is the recommendation from those agencies. However, the other part of that is, if a student or, or staff member, but if a student is less than six feet from someone for 15 minutes or more, and that someone eventually is determined to be positive for COVID-19, then those seated within six feet are considered close contacts by Allegheny County, by PA Department of Health, by the CDC, and would need to quarantine uh, as a result of that. And so in this slide, again, we're symbolizing that student who might be determined to be positive as the red rectangle. As we increase the number of students, rectangles, we decrease the distance between them. And in this example, the students in yellow would need to quarantine. So earlier when I showed an example at Eden Hall where there's a single case and there's six students who are quarantined, that's something like this. And that's, that's what that means. And that's been a part of the, the communication process. But that's probably the most frequently asked question. Uh, the next most frequently asked question is around the details of what quarantine means. So this information is taken from the CDC. All the agencies are aligned right now. Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, and, and the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention. Quarantine was reduced from 14 days to 10 days. So one option if you're in quarantine now is 10 days, you don't have to have any testing done, and you may return on day 11. So that's one form of quarantine uh, that can be utilized. The other option, and this is where we've gotten some questions, are for people who want to further shorten the quarantine period. And again, we quarantine healthy people. So you're quarantined healthy as a precaution. So the way that works is, and again, all the agencies are aligned. If on day five, you want to get a test and there's no specific test um, required, doesn't have to be a PCR test, for example, it can be um, a rapid test. But if a test, we prefer PCR because they're more accurate, uh, but we cannot require that. If on day five, a, a student was to be tested, and turn out to be negative, and we have that result, then they could return on day eight. So they have further shortened the quarantine period from 10 without testing to returning on day eight uh, with a negative test as long as the test has happened on day five. So this is what we are doing. It's challenging to communicate this accurately and we get a lot of questions, but this is what is in place. And again, there is agency alignment in terms of options to reduce quarantine wrong advance button. Vaccinations. We are in a vastly different place from a professional standpoint today than we were um, a month ago, two months ago. Almost, if not every educator who wanted to be vaccinated at Pine Richland School District has had the opportunity to be vaccinated either through the Johnson & Johnson, which was administered through the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, single dose, or Pfizer and Moderna through something that they scheduled through their own, um, own approach. Those others, Pfizer and Moderna are two dose, Johnson and Johnson one dose. Greater than or equal to two weeks after the last or only dose, someone is considered, quote, fully vaccinated, end quote. Day-to-day -day operations at our school, that doesn't mean anything. So I am fully vaccinated. I wear a mask. I have no different expectations today than I did before relative to, you know, what's going on. However, if it were determined that I was a close contact of someone who became positive, because I am fully vaccinated, I would not need to quarantine. So that's true of those who are fully vaccinated as long as they remain asymptomatic. So as long as there's no other indication of symptoms, then there is not a need to quarantine. For now, that's staff focused. The time will come though, where as more testing and approvals happen, we'll begin to see students 
uh, begin to be vaccinated, and so there'll be implications of that. But that's just a quick note on vaccination. So this is the, really the critical thing, which is how, do we, how are we going to make a decision left or right on the continuum and what's going to help us uh, determine whether some action is necessary? So again, we're monitoring the overall conditions. We work with Allegheny County Health Department. The variant that everybody's heard about uh, is now dominant in the United States for new cases. The same is true in Pennsylvania. We're seeing, they're seeing that variant in Allegheny County. The first thing we monitor is the 14-day rolling window. And again, this is building specific. So my two cents is that future decisions will be building based and not system based. So if we need to make decisions because something's happening somewhere, it is far more likely that we will be building based in our decision making and not apply a decision across the entire system based on what the data is telling us. So what we're monitoring are the number of cases because the number of cases may dictate within those thresholds the need to close the school for one, two, or some number of days. But the other thing is how disruptive or how much of a, a concern to continuity is the need to quarantine. So as we increase students, as we decrease physical distancing, as cases emerge, we're going to see the need to quarantine more students. This has been happening at school districts all around the region all year long. We have been in a position based upon where we were and our model design where quarantine was almost never needed. We're beginning to see more need for quarantine and we can expect to see more need for quarantine. At some point, and there isn't going to be a magic number I don't believe, but at some point there may be an emergence of cases or a scope of quarantine that makes the decision um, one that we have to consider in terms of doing something different at that school or for a short period of time. So again, I, I wish that there was a clear, bright line number. I don't believe that that exists. We're going to have to monitor the circumstances, but I do think we can make building-based decisions as opposed to um, a broader brush. Uh, and again, any period of closure is for contact tracing, cleaning, communication with families and looking to see what's happening with transmission. So one of the things that we're monitoring as well is if we needed to quarantine a number of students, did any of the students who were quarantined based on a school contact later um, become symptomatic or positive for COVID-19? Even though we can't necessarily put a causal connection between the two things, we will monitor that to understand what's happening. And again, we've seen almost no evidence of that in the school day program. Other schools in this region have seen almost no evidence of transmission within the school day program as long as mitigation's in place. We have certainly seen it in athletic or other higher risk activities, and that's consistent with what's happening um, in the community. I'll mention again, all the things changed. Dr. Pasquinelli provided an update, uh, will provide an update briefly about some changes to capacity and the quarantine that we already mentioned today. Uh, but again, there's the, this is sort of the, the process and where we are. So there may be the need to make determinations about a building. We'll weigh those determinations based on these points, uh, but, but there are not necessarily clear and bright lines that are gonna help us to do that. Uh, and finally, as I tried to, you know, we're all in this together and what's ha what happens in the community, what happens in the school. Uh, one of the most critical things, and it, if we could do this first one um, really faithfully, it would be a significant help. And that is oftentimes we learn from situations that someone was experiencing mild cold symptoms and did not suspect that it might have been COVID-19. And so they're in school or they're participating in an activity only to find out later. And I think it's because again, people, they're waiting for something more significant. And when it's mild, they don't necessarily connect the dots. Um, this is going to be more challenging with seasonal allergies and just the circumstances right now. But ultimately, those who have seasonal allergies know it and they traditionally have seasonal allergies. Those that don't, have to really pay attention to um, even mild symptoms. And if we can prevent 
attendance at school on days where there's mild symptoms, then if something later turns out to be a positive case, we avoid the quarantine and sort of that rippling effect that happens with that. Uh, so we just have to keep paying attention to the discipline of our other strategies. Uh, we are communicating routine reminders and athletics and activities, and it's not just what happens on the field or in a place of play. It's how you get to and from. It might be carpooling. It might be other, you know, other things that, that, um, that can occur. Uh, so again, we'll continue to monitor quarantine students. That's our update for tonight. So we'll stop the podcast there. Are there any questions about any of the tonight's content? I think it's important to note that with our model, we've managed to go the entire year without an unplanned shutdown to date, unlike some of the neighboring schools, and I won't name names, that have had to shut their schools for a period of days because of large case numbers. So very proud that we've been able to get this far and get to a point where nearly all the teachers are vaccinated before we brought all the kids back to school. So I think that's, that's very important, uh, two very important things about our, our approach. And thank you for, again, the, the, the transparency in the, in the decision-making process and the updates. You know, we hear this every board meeting, but it's important to keep hearing it as to why we're doing what we're doing and, and how, you know, um, and how the, how the schools are reacting to it. Just Brian, one just one second on the um, athletic and activity health and safety plan. So as Dr. Miller mentioned, we made some minor revisions. We just want to keep the board and community updated in those revisions. Um, revisions are around capacity limits. So on April 4th, there were guideline changes that now has a 25% of maximum capacity for indoor activities and 50% of maximum capacity for outdoor activities. We still though have to consider the six feet between family units. So that number may be less depending on the activity that we are presenting to the um, students and, and community. So that's being communicated through either our school-based team or our um, athletic teams to let people know by invitation how many can participate in terms of spectators. And then we did modify based upon those new uh, quarantine guidelines. So that's part of the health and safety plan uh, after tonight's meeting that'll be posted and updated to our website. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any callers in the waiting room? We do not. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Student staff recognition, Ms. Hawthorne. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Buckle up and stay alert. We have a long list of student <laughs> activity <laughs> items tonight. First off, Pine Richland students earned top awards at the 82nd Pittsburgh Regional Science and Engineering Fair, which was held virtually on March 24th. From the high school, we have junior Andrew Nee earning first place in the senior biology division, and he qualifies for the international competition. Junior Mish Sethi earned third place in the senior medicine health microbiology division and earned the sponsor awards from Carnegie Mellon University, chapter of Sigma and Mu Alpha Theta. Sno sophomore Brianna Franchek earned a sponsor award from the Allegheny County Medical Society Alliance. From the middle school, we have eighth grader Seneca Dalvey and seventh grader Anukta Shook placing third in the computer science category for a project entitled Celebites. The two created an app that can track student snack intake and motivates the user to make healthier choices. In the intermediate engineering robotics category, eighth grader Aris Corrales placed second for a segmented project entitled Project Pebble. And that, in develop that involves developing a plan to create an affordable, convenient machine that is capable of preparing a meal. So I can't wait till her <laughs> the second part of that project. That should be exciting. Those three middle school students are among the top 10% of winners and have been nominated to the Broadmasters Nation's Premier Science and Engineering Competition for middle school students, so congratulations. Also, eighth graders Alan Chen, Nathan Lee, and Michael Tunder completed a project entitled How COVID Affected Pollution. While the team did not win an award, the project is very worthy of mention as the team focused on obviously an extremely relevant topic, and they really studied the global effects of the pandemic and how it impacted the earth rather than focusing on the negative 
effects of the virus and they found that if people stayed home they were limiting like car emissions and such so good job with with that project hundreds of students throughout the region participated in the annual national history day competition held virtually eighth graders Seneca Dalvi and Ab Ava Spagnoli earned the first place in the junior group exhibit eighth graders Abigail Anderson Claire Dosh Sydney Candor earned second place in the junior website category. Eighth graders Sean Burke, Alan Chen, and Will Tambury earned a second place in the junior group documentary. All will move on to the state competition in May under the direction of teachers Joseph Bailey and Keith Rentler. At the high school level, seniors Michael Lessie, Anthony Hartwood, Joshua Remby, and Victor Williams earned first place in the senior group performance category. They will move on to the state competition under the te direction of teacher Jason Goldsmith. Also, sophomore Ella Gasek and Catherine Yanni are in third place in the senior group website category under the direction of teacher Tim Irvin. A Pine Richland Middle School Odyssey of the Mind team qualified to compete at the PA state final competition. The team competed at the Western Regional version of the competition and earned first place in the team's division in the spontaneous problem category. Now this is a category where the team has no knowledge of what the problem is and they excelled at that. Participants are judged on creative and teamwork and the team also had to solve a long-term project. Teacher Kathy Deal, who sponsored the group, says the winning team was made up of seventh graders Connor Barcaske, Aaron Farrar, Carlton Fogliani, Mateen Hassan, Logan Keegan, and Joel Newhart. Parent Kirsten Bar Bar Barcaske also served as the team's coach, so congratulations. Also, senior Kirsten Chilcote has been selected as a 2021 National Honor Society Scholar. She was chosen from nearly 10,000 applicants. Recipients are chosen based on work that supports the four pillars of the NHS, including scholarship, service, leadership, and character. She will also receive money to use toward higher ed. Junior, junior Nora Carter was selected to the four Pennsylvania 4-H State Council, the highest level of youth leadership within the 4-H organization. She is the first youth ever selected from Allegheny County and she will serve as Vice President of Operations. Congratulations. Seniors Kristen Donahoe, Victor Williams, and Junior Nora Russell have been selected to the Pennsylvania Music Educators Association's All-State Choir to be held April 14th through the 17th. This is Nora's second time being selected. All three participated in the district PMA program and with seniors Danielle Mar Daniel Martinez, Abigail Turner, and Rebecca Washner, juniors Lacey Duffy, and Fiona Courtney, and sophomores Paige Johnson and Bryn Serloff. In addition, junior Aiden Frick, a trombonist, has been selected for the PMEA All-State Wind Ensemble. Also, Audience members will be hitting the books when the students from the middle school drama club teach history, grammar, and math through clever and tuneful songs in the production of Schoolhouse Rock Live Junior. You may remember that as a child during your uh, years of watching. <laughs> and I see Dr. Miller shaking his head. <laughs> so so uh, that's... Junction, water yep. Door, <laughs> right, Dr. Pink, absolutely. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so uh, that'll be, be an exciting thing to bring back memories. But at the high school, they're also working on a video production of the high school musical. And student director Haley Wren says this year's piece allows the cast to get a taste of what it would be like to star in a film versus a stage production. Both the middle and high school productions will be coming to a video for the PR community sometime in May. We will send information via the e-blast and website, so stay tuned. The high school hockey team defeated Upper St. Clair 4-5 in the first round of the PA Interscholastic Hockey League playoff on April 2nd. The team will take on Mount Lebanon, and they will be playing at 8.30, so just a little less than an hour at the Robert Morris Uni uh, University Island Sports Center. Senior Cole Spencer represented Pine Richland High School in Whippeal along with his coaches Caleb Holb and Rob Hunt in the 47th annual Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic on April 2nd. 
Whippio won 41 to 6. Now for football, Cole Spencer was just named the inaugural recipient of the Willie Thrower Memorial Award honoring the top quarterback in Southwestern PA for the 2021 season. So congratulations. Middle school wrestlers also competed at the Pennsylvania Junior High Wrestling State Tournament on April 2nd. Eighth, eighth grader Vaughn Spencer, you may recognize his na last name, won the state tournament for the third year in a row. He won his final match 10 to zip, zip to become the only Pine Richland wrestler to ever win two junior state titles. Eighth graders Dominic Ferraro and Matt Miller both went three to two, losing last to second decisions to the eventual state runner up. So strong effort by those two as well. The Pine Richland High School Black Student Union and peer to peer organizations are hosting a t-shirt fundraiser to support diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives, including the purchase of multicultural crayon sets for students in grades K to three. And you can uh, also, uh, 2015 Pine Richland graduate Callahan Miller helped design the logo that they used and it, it's saying together stronger. So if you'd like to learn more about that or order a t-shirt by April 22nd, visit pinerichland.org for those details. Tonight's recognition had lots of first place winners, but uh, not so in a recent Kahoot game that featured questions about Ramsway and topics students are learning this year at the middle school. However, the st staff did find a way to brighten the spirits of all students who didn't place first with some of the jokes uh, from their favorite staff members. Now we won't play the video, but we can say the jokes were extremely corny, so much so you have to laugh. So for example, does anybody know what kind of tree a math teacher climbs? Anyone? Oh, uh, of course, <laughs> oh, <I'm glad> it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good job. Did you see that coming from the <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe Dr. Pasquinelli would get that. But anyway, um, t if you want some time for a laugh, go ahead and click on that video. It's on Board Docs, and we'll also put it at pinewoodsland.org. Also tonight, we will uh, we are supposed to introduce uh, librarian uh, Beth Shenefell. Is she? Is she? Oh, right. Yeah. So tonight, I'm here. Yeah, we'd like <laughs> we'd like to spotlight School Library Month, which is celebrated in April, and. Mrs. Shanafeld is here to provide us with a presentation regarding the roles and responsibilities of school library. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Beth Shenafeld, and I am the librarian at Eden Hall, and I'm also the library department chairperson for the Pine Ridge School District. I want to thank you for allowing me a few minutes to share some of the exciting things that we're doing in our libraries as we celebrate School Library Month. Go ahead to the next slide. I guess I should too. Our district librarians appreciate the support of the Pine Ridge and School Board and our district leadership as we endeavor to provide the best library services to our students and staff. We're grateful to have certified librarians working in each building as well as library assistants without whom we couldn't achieve all that we do. Next slide, please. It's been nearly a year since we shared the results of our um, library department in-depth program review. During our presentation, we unveiled our library department philosophy statement, sparking curiosity, creating connections, empowering learners. We also shared our vision image shown here. Tonight's presentation will provide you with some specific examples of how we have been living into these guiding documents. And please note that in the interest of time, tonight's presentation will be an abridged version of the full presentation that's been sent to you. So I encourage you to explore the presentation in its entirety, including the links to the student works. Next slide, please. In order to encourage our students to develop and satisfy their personal curiosity, our librarians design a variety of experiences in which they read widely and deeply. We plan programming for events such as World Read Aloud Day and Read Across America Week, and the Battle of the Books is popular at several levels. However, tonight I'd like to spotlight two activities that take, took place this year at the elementary level. Next slide. Story walks were a new addition to the library program this year. Hans Elementary School installed two outdoor story walks and students were able to read stories as they got some fresh air and walked the track. Um, the, the diverse titles on the walk were also featured on the morning announcements. A prof grant has been written um, to make the story walk become a permanent fixture and Wexford School is also planning on an outdoor story walk. Next slide, please. 
At Eden Hall, the fifth grade students are participating in Genius Hour, an inquiry-based process to investigate topics of personal interest. Um, following a process model, the students choose topics, writing their own essential questions and investigate to find information that might help them answer the questions. Um, notice the, the variety of topics shown here in these sample questions. These questions were actually developed by the students themselves. Um, they're eventually going to create something that they share based on what they've learned and they'll share that with an authentic audience. Next, please. The Pine Ridge Librarians foster personal and professional connections among the learning community at the school, district, local, and national levels. Next slide. Um, our librarians connect through collaborative partnerships with teachers in all content areas. Uh, the word cloud on the right there provides examples of specific projects and departments with which our librarians have partnered this year. Some of these projects are true collaborative projects in which the learning goals of the content area and the library curricula are addressed. Um, some of these are cooperative partnerships in which the librarian is providing support to the content area teacher. In either case, the librarian um, needs to have a firm grasp of the content area curricula. Next slide, please. We also connect our students to experts outside of the district. Um, so this year, our middle school librarian was able to connect her students to author Lois Lowry through a partnership with the Carnegie Library's Words and Picture Series. Students were able to interact with Ms. Lowry directly, giving them an unforgettable educational experience. Through webinars and virtual visits, the Pine Ridge students are able to connect with multiple authors this year. Next slide, please. The library program review recommendations intersect with the recommendations of the other departments and our district's strategic goals in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So our librarians are collaborating with the ELA department on revising and updating the core novel list to reflect more diverse titles. At the high school level, our librarian was able to connect high school staff with diverse resources through this linked resource guide that you see here. And again, you're encouraged to take a look at that when you have a chance. Next slide, please. With the portrait of a PR graduate in mind, our librarians strive to empower students to develop the skills and dispositions for future success. In response to COVID-19, digital citizenship skills moved to the forefront and librarians taught learners how to manage their digital life. Next slide. This year, our librarians demonstrated flexibility in our library operations in order to continue to provide library services from curbside pickup and ex expanded digital resources to self renewal and virtual office hours. We showed that the library is more than just the physical space. Our librarians empower our learners with the skills to independently ac access resources, services and programming. Next slide, please. Our learners are not only students, but our colleagues, including our learners are not only our students, but also our colleagues, including teachers, paraprofessionals, administrators. Um, our librarians are actively leading at many levels, empowering educators, both in the Pine Richland School District and beyond to provide the best educational experiences for their students. Next slide, please. Oh, that one's not supposed to be in there. <laughs> but I do would like you to take a chance, take a look at these. Um, when you click on these videos, these are um, some of our darling students who have, said, have some positive things to say about our libraries. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, the Pine Original Librarians would like to thank you for your continued support of our school libraries. We appreciate having this opportunity to highlight some of the wonderful activities and programming available to our Pine Ridgeland students. Um, please feel free to reach out to any of our district librarians to learn more about the essential role that our school librarians play. Happy School Library Month, and thank you so much for this time. Thank you. Ms. Shenneville, thank you so much. Um, that, that presentation and the full version that's on the website for people at home has all those clickable links uh, to really answer that question. How can you guys try to accomplish so much and bite off so much and have that impact and showing the students really engaging in those projects and what they actually meant. Uh, just tremendous effort. There's a lot there and I encourage the board and the public to explore it. Thank you, really great job. Thank you so much, I appreciate the time. I wanna thank you as well, Beth, really quickly and also uh, Mrs. Gustafson as the administrative liaison to your department. Um, you guys are a dynamic duo, the synergy, the energy, the passion and what you've said in this distilled version captures all of that, but there's so much more to it. The layers, the, the way you're integrating so much of the district's strategic um, plan within the work that you're doing. It isn't about the library, but it's about the district and where we're going with kids. So thank you for all you do. Yeah, and when, when Beth said leading at many levels uh, through her humility, she and Kelly, Kristen Rowe, they're leading not only at the state level, but nationally as well. So they have an active voice in what's happening in libraries across the United States, and they work to bring 
uh, their understandings and learnings back to the district. So that was awesome. Thanks, Beth. Your timeline was perfect, so well done. <laughs> I practiced. I practiced. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot in there. Thank you. Thank you. A tremendous recognition, Rachel. A tremendous recognition. Obviously, a lot of opportunities in extracurricular activities and engagement. A lot of them look different this year, uh, but I'm glad to see that engagement, those opportunities. Uh, to form connections inside and outside of the classroom are available to our students. So thank you so much. Correspondence, Ms. Williams. John Corey emailed the board regarding mental health. Susan Hong emailed thanking the board regarding return to school. Donna McWhorter emailed thanking the board regarding competitive cheer. Jan S <coughs> Jane Slater con contacted the board regarding taxes. And Nora Carter emailed the board regarding personnel. Thank you. I didn't want to close the loop. We did have a caller uh, talk about competitive cheer, possibly doing a trip to Florida. We did reach back out and contact the team. In the end, it was not workable. We, we tried to cooperate to get something up, but it was not something that there was interest in, in the end. That's what you just said is 100% accurate. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure we close that loop. Item 1.06 <clears throat> is a motion to approve the meeting minutes as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. For item 2.01, it's our strategic plan update. Dr. Maura Paxan is here to discuss mental health and wellness. Dr. Paxan. We can, we can hear you, but I think uh, Mr. Karpinski is going to check your mic. There you go. Excellent, excellent. Now we um, can really hear you. Yeah, okay. I'll back up just a little bit. Um, even with a mask on, I'm pretty loud. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come this evening. It's such a passionate topic for me, but as a district, we I'm really proud of all of our teams, our teachers, our counselors, our psychologists, our administrators. We support our students and wrap our arms around our students and really want to provide them the best support as possible. I go back to a little back in time. Over the year, what's your mantra? What do you have for the year in terms of as a family, as an individual? Like I always say, I'm riding that wave, right? There's good days, there's bad days. But looking at back to the future, we have that PR graduate and that health and wellness. So I went back, looked at January of last school year, we talked about the health and wellness of our PR graduate and really focusing on some of those healthy resiliency skills of how are we sleeping? Are we sleeping nine to 10 hours in the evening? Are we exercising enough? Are we drinking water? Are we having, I always say that water regulates those cortisol levels, which decreases our stress levels, right? So making sure you're drinking eight glasses of water a day, making sure you're exercising, getting outside, having family time. That's just really healthy resiliency skills that we all can practice and really want to encourage our graduates to leave here with, right? Our seniors to leave with those healthy skills. So we talk about that resiliency and we talk about wrapping our arms around our kids. We're that human tool, that human tool, that protective factor to help support our students. So we have those external protective factors as well as those internal protective factors. And think of it as the five R's in resiliency. So really think about like, we're gonna reassure, we're in this together, you're not alone. Encouraging really that growth mindset. Focusing on routine, structure is good for all of us. So if we have good routine, it makes us feel good. It decreases our stressors, right? So continuing to have that routine, whatever model we're in, but it's great for all of us as adults, but also for kids. And then also enough rest, focusing on your rest, and thinking about rest as a family of like downtime with electronics, even though we're in the virtual world at times, but really taking it off, turning it off at times. And then in addition to that, really focusing on that recreational time, those activities, what you're doing as a family, family game night, focusing on dinner time. So, and what we really need to do as adults is we need to model that behavior. So we're those role models. Kids feel our behavior, they feel our emotions. So we really need to be that role model and practice some good self-care. 
In addition to that, we also need to look at overall, how are we really supporting our kids and making sure if it's more than just stress, are we referring them to the right care that that individual might need? And this is a big question. Families will ask us, hey, listen, when is it stress or when is it more than just stress? And there's stress that's good stress, which helps us out with tests or helps us out if we have to present something. But then when is it that threshold? When does it cross that line? So really looking at the continuum and saying, listen, is this stress too much? Is there a change in behavior? In the school system, we say, listen, change in behavior, two weeks. Are we seeing change in attendance, change in grades, change in emotions? With our little kids, we see more of those tantrums, where you'll notice them show more tantrums or they'll have some separation anxiety. With older kids, we'll see more of that irritability, mm -hmm. hyperactivity, impulsivity, lack of focus, um, where, and knowing when it's different than just normal adolescence, right? where they're talking about hopelessness, they're impulsive, they're talking about hurting themselves or killing themselves, then we need to get help for those individuals immediately. So in this presentation, we added the, a list of numbers, those immediate contacts. So if students are talking about they want to hurt themselves, they want to kill themselves, we need to get help for them. And then also we wanted to include specifically overall resources. Our counselors are a great resource to all of our students. They look at attendance, they look at behaviors. Not only do they go into the classroom and provide social emotional learning within that classroom setting, they also do individual groups as well as individual sessions with kids. So really reach out to your school counselor. If your child is struggling, we encourage that. We also have our school psychologist K through 12. So our psychologist, we have Dr. Um, Taylor Kimmel, who's K through six. And then we also have um, Dr. Missy Ramirez, which is seven through 12. So reach out to the school psychologist as well, because we are another great resource of supports. Um, and another support that we have is our multi-tiered <clears throat> systems level of support. And that is K through eight that we have this support. And through our MTSS model, I like to explain it as our multi-dimensional, multi-faceted model, which really helps support kids if they're struggling academically, as well as with any behaviors. So we really encourage if there is reading problems, learning problems, executive functioning difficulties, reach out to the counselor, reach out to your teacher, because we have MTSS um, teams in each of our buildings who will help support our students. Um, another great resource is Ram's Way. I love that Rachel gave a little shout out to Ram's Way today with her joke. But think about um, Ram's Way as that positive reinforcement to encourage respectful, accountable, motivated, and safe. Really to encourage that positive school climate, giving that positive reinforcement to our students. As well as we have our school-based mental health counselors, um, which is through Holy Family. And that is counselors that are in all of our buildings, K through 12. So they're mental health counselors in each of our buildings at the elementary, at Eden Hall, the middle school and the high school, and really provide those mental health services. And it can be completely confidential. If families want to release consent to speak with the counselors in the school, you can. But if you wanted to keep it confidential, that is also something that is offered. So again, that is, that is services offered throughout our schools. Um, in addition, we have our student assistance teams that are in all of the schools, K through, tw K through 12, where we have teachers on those teams, counselors, psychologists, administrators, and all trained in mental health to provide supports. So I go back to that resiliency model is the layer of support, protective factors to help our students. And really want you to go to each of these links because on the links, it goes to who are those supports in the building, like our student assistants at Eden Hall or student assistants at the high school. We've had over 288 referrals for students this school year through our student assistance programs. And again, that's a level and a layer of supports for our students. So it's supports within the classroom setting as well as outside supports. Because when you think of mental health, again, it's that continuum. It's not um, extreme. Some kids just might need counseling. Some kids might need counseling on top of maybe an intensive outpatient partial program, or maybe it's an inpatient hospitalization. But again, it's a continuum based on that student need. I also encourage families to talk to their PCP, their primary care physician, because through their, our PCPs, you could have a mental health screening. 
So again, there's layers of support to get those services to our students. And then also on our website, we also have our suicide prevention resource. And through there, I always say, look at those risk factors, look at those warning signs, and look at the resources available to your students. Um, because they're wonderful, and we encourage our kids to look at those as well, to get those services and supports for family members or friends. And if you go to the next, oh wait, I have it. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna be able to hit it on here though. I'm like, um, <laughs> an extra click. Um, but on the site too, and I want to reference it, is we put a resource packet together of homework resources for families, executive functioning resources, as well as resiliency, mental health um, resources, all within that top bullet point. So please go through if you, oh, look at you, Rachel, thank you. <laughs> oh, and the sound looks so lovely, yes. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> but going through those, it certainly has those resiliency, it has resiliency for our families, has mental health resources for our families, as well as grief and loss. Um, a lot of resources that are wonderful. I encourage everyone to go to that and page through it as you're listening to it and um, review it to get the additional supports for your child. Thank you. Thanks for letting me come this evening. And if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? <clears throat> Dr. Bra Baxton, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. I really appreciate the update, and it couldn't be more timely as well. Can you go back a couple slides more? I think maybe just one. Uh, the one with the Holy Family, school-based mental health. This one. Yeah. So a couple things. First, uh, we just heard Beth Shenefield, and Beth Shenefield is a leader in library education, an advocate, and so now we have Dr. Paxan. And for all of her self-deprecating humor, which is appreciated, uh, we have literally one of the foremost subject matter experts, certainly in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, in our district. So in addition to her passion for, for student health and wellness and supporting schools and students, she is like the great connector. She and her team understand how challenging it is for families to not only understand they may need to access care, but then to be able to access care. And they are constantly connecting families with resources, working with counselors to put all those pieces together. It's been how many years since we did our first school-based mental health? Five? Five years. Five years. So five years ago, starting at the, at the high school, we had a partnership with Holy Family to do school-based mental health, to eliminate a barrier, which for some is time and space. They can't get to the appointment or they cannot get access. And how do we create a confidential opportunity for those families who want or need that service? It has been five years. And we've had it at every school now for a few. Oh yeah, K through 12, it's been at every school for at least four years. Yeah, so again, this is, this is one other example of something that people just don't think about, recognize, or understand. And it's hard because we communicate out a number of resources that are available in the district, but it doesn't sort of hit until the time that you need it. And so, again, it's a, it's a never-ending passion for Dr. P to work with other leaders to, to keep her fingers <clears throat> on the pulse of the district and to connect uh, with all of the network of supports that are out there, some in our schools, and some outside of our school. So we're very fortunate to have you. We appreciate uh, the update. This topic has come up at recent board meetings um, with some of our speakers to ask questions about what exists or what's in place or what does that look like. The most important thing is we could tell every family, if you're feeling something or worried, just call. Call the counseling office or call the school administrator. We'll quickly funnel that to the right place. You don't have to worry about knowing who to call. Call somebody, we'll get it to the right spot and then we'll see what services or supports are appropriate and then work from there. So uh, again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You know, we moved my kids when they were adolescents. 
and they faced some challenges. We moved during middle school, which is a tough move. And um, the school, when we, when we finally realized we needed to reach out, the school was so responsive. Dr. Paxson's office was amazing. It's just sometimes hard as parents to know when. So my word to parents would be don't hesitate. Um, they will work with you. They will help you figure out what they have here is just amazing and made a huge difference in my children's life. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Item 3.01 is a consent agenda, a motion to approve items 3.02 through 3.12 as attached. Second. Is there any discussion or desire to have an item pulled from the consent agenda at this time? Seeing how there is none, we'll vote. All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda item carries. Finance, Mr. Kashani. Yes, sir. Item 4.01, motion to approve the financial reports dated February 28, 2021 and accounts payable dated April 12th, 2021 in the amount of $1,059,402.49 and paid accounts for March, April in, in the amount of $945,286.35 as listed. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.02, motion to approve the budget transfers in the amount of $83,941 as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.03, motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the incurring of non-electoral debt to refund all or a portion of the school district's general obligation bonds refunding series 2016 as presented to the board. Second. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> I just would like to, um, for everyone's benefit, just ask uh, Dana, I forget if we, I'm sure we did, but I forget um, how long we have to make our decision which of the options we would prefer. So that is a great segue because I was just about to bring that up. Um, you have in front of you a, an updated sheet um, from Mr. Masidi um, from PNC Capital Markets today. It provides you with the three different options of what the savings looks like as of today. Bond pricing will not occur until next week, so obviously this is subject to change. Um, but this does show you the three options that we've discussed before, which is kind of level debt service reduction over the remaining life of the bonds, um, taking the savings up front. Um, basically, the gross savings between those two options is relatively the same. The largest amount of savings would be if we shorten the term of the debt, which is the third column to the right. Um, however, in the past, when we have looked at some of the more significant bond refundings, we've talked about shortening the term. And we've done that primarily because we were trying to, again, make a severe impact in terms of our debt service. As we look at our budget for next year, we kind of started at the beginning of March with a budget deficit of about 1.9 million. I have it down to about 1.5 million. I'm not sure about the board's comfort level at this point <clears throat> in terms of what we would like to do with this type of savings. If we're looking at the first two columns, we know that the savings between the level debt service and the upfront savings is, again, relatively the same. So I'm just kind of floating it out there. We kind of need to make the decision at some point before next Monday about the pricing just so that we can kind of give some direction to PNC Capital Markets. Um, but we've already been through our bond rating call. We have a draft op, um, official statement at this point, and we are moving right along in terms of this refunding. So not sure if we want to have a discussion at this point, um, you know, about yeah. the three different options. Well, that's, yeah, so that's very helpful, Dana. Thank you. So maybe if I can make an attempt uh, for the layperson, uh, so if we talk if we talk cash flow today, the net present value cash uh, 
flow today. So level means we'll save about 20 grand a year uh, through 2031, right? So we can save 20 grand this year and then 20 grand in future years up to 2031. <clears throat> or we could save it all this year, almost $200,000 worth of cash this year with the upfront uh, middle option. And then, or we can save a roughly a little bit more, but roughly the same amount a lot later uh, in that last option. And, and to your point, I remember by reducing the term, there was, there was more of a delta. Uh, when we chose to go with shortening the term, the net present value savings was a lot greater um, Correct. in some of those other refundings. Yes. So. And it is still greater in this option. So just to be clear, yeah. that is the greatest level of savings. By, um, the, by the tune of about 16 grand. Correct. Which is less than a small rock. Exactly. So that's kind of where I was headed was yeah. that, it, you know, when we were talking about some of those more significant bond issues, to shorten the term made absolute sense at that time because that was the greatest amount of savings that we could create for our community yeah. and for our taxpayers. In this case, because this is a relatively smaller, you know, bond issue, um, the giant delta, as you indicated, is not substantial yeah. Yeah. between all of the options. So as we're looking at a budgetary deficit for next year, this will essentially settle, you know, around the July timeframe. So I would factor in an estimate for what this is going to look like in next year's budget, which will then reduce the amount that we are projecting to pull from assigned fund balance for routed toward the green gym project. Mm. So not sure again, well, you know, so if we want to kind of change what we've done in the past, but this is a smaller bond issue that could allow us a little bit more flexibility in next year's budget. So given we're all here together except for Greg, um, I think it would be healthy to maybe talk about this now. Mm -hmm. um, and that way Dana would have clarity and, and direction from us. So um, any, any other thoughts, comments? I have a, but I'll wait. No, I'll wait. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, and, 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 and so to recap, what, what referring to this attachment from PNC, um, I don't know if we, do we have that up on the screen, by the way? I don't think, I don't so, think so, so, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> as Mark was saying, we sort of have level savings, which saves $20,000 a year. There is an option where we don't really get any cash flow savings in terms of our annual debt service, but we could get a windfall of about 200000 And that windfall 200000 would um, reduce any potential uh, withdrawals from fund balance for to a fund signed capital improvement. <coughs> to a Correct, fund capital because improvement. we're projecting a large amount yeah. for the capital funding plan for next year. So and, it would and, essentially be a funding source towards that. Here's here's my take. And, and and finally we have the third option which is what we've done, which is shorten the debt. And yeah. so shortening the debt to me has always been a goal. And um, whenever we don't go fully into that, I'm always like ah. we break it down because well there's always something that comes up, right? Our debt has been too long. These moves, every time you shorten it, makes it better, improves the bond rating, gives additional flexibility to the future. <clears throat> we have 26 or eight, eight? 28 million in fund balance. I think breaking that discipline to get a $200,000 windfall to fund current capital projects, it doesn't work. If you feel that, if you feel that needy, then we should be raising taxes this year. I mean, that, that's really where I'm at. Like, if we can't afford to, you know, and, and yes, it's small. This is small all around, you know. There's that one credit card. It came in. I usually pay my balance. I didn't pay this one off. But the disciplined person does every month, even though that doesn't matter much. So, you know, I, yeah. I, 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 I look at it like that, like just setting the discipline of, hey, you know. I appreciate discipline. I guess just to offer another take. So, um I could I could save one hundred and ninety three thousand not one hundred and ninety four thousand almost dollars today. Get that today or two hundred and nine in twenty thirty one. Right? So I can save two hundred and nine in twenty thirty one or one ninety four today 
when we're dealing with a budget deficit because of COVID, frankly. I mean, most of what we're looking at right now is because of COVID, which is a very unique situation, right? right. So if that delta, like for me, so for 16 grand, I'd rather have the money today, break the discipline because it's such a unique time, right? And, and, and help, and help our, our budget out this year. Uh, so um, otherwise, if, 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 if the delta was larger, I might think different. So for 16 grand, I'd rather have it today because we could use the cash today. From a fixed income guy's perspective, you're just reiterating the other, the other thing, the other side of that coin is we really shouldn't leave $28 million sitting in the bank because it's going to be worth $29 million in half a century. <clears throat> because what that is a function of is that interest rates are nearly zero. That's why, that's that gap. That's what that gap <clears throat> is. So you're just sort of saying the same, you know, it's, it's sort of the other side of that coin. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, um, frankly, I think it's an, e it's a harder decision in some ways, but it's easier uh, in, 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 uh, in other ways too, because that same fund balance is also what has helped our rating to have that fund balance where it is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'd rather not deplete that because the delta is so small. I'm, 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 I'm just leaning on the fact it's 16 grand. 16 grand just for me is like, um, it's worth taking the cash. I kind of heard in Dana's voice, I don't know. I heard in Dana's voice, <laughs> help me, help me. 200 grand helps me. So I'd rather, I'd rather help Dana today. I feel like you've sensed me, but yes, I, so I, I do agree with you. I mean, I, I tend to look at these things in terms of the magnitude. So some of the refundings that we've had in the past have been extremely significant and i have felt extraordinarily comfortable with shortening the term because again that's been the best for the district and for the community but when i look at that delta and i look at the challenges that we're currently facing and the unknowns that we're looking at for the next fiscal year for the first time in a long time i am feeling comfortable <clears throat> with any of the options but i would also because again you you know i don't normally bring to you an option even on a a piece of paper that even gives you an upfront cash out i don't normally even include that but i'm including it just because we don't normally face this type of budgetary deficit at sure. this point in the fiscal year leading into next year. So Dan, the only thing you didn't do was highlight column two and wink when you talked about it. In red yeah. and like highlight yeah, right. in yellow. But yes. <laughs> but so and we also don't have to decide now. So if if we want to talk more outside of this evening, we could, but if we I just let's just take another anyone else like to offer their thoughts. So we know what Peter yeah. Matt? Yeah, so um, I guess where I am on this is that 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 16k is such a small amount um, that that um, the picture really is more multi-year going into the future on deficits, and so you know I don't know how much even taking the 200k up front now will really matter that much. Well, we're looking at some of those expenditures two, three, four years from now with, with the fund balance that we have. So those, those issues loom large, whether we take 200K now or, you know, or, or just shorten the debt. So in my view, the comparative advantage of having that 200 now compared with our fund balance and the larger issues we're face, facing, it may not make sense to take the money now. What would you, so what, what options? I, it would, would be it would be just shorten the debt, okay. maintain the discipline, um, and and go forward from there. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? We have another bond yeah, guy I, who's. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it, I'm gonna pull it out of you because it's sitting there and it's somewhere in your head. I'm still really thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to agree with Dana, but also I see your best point. Yeah, I want to agree with Dana too. It's just <laughs> let me say this: the one thing I'll. <laughs> I actually feel totally comfortable yeah. with any of these three. The mm -hmm. only thing is, I so rarely bring to you a budget with a deficit that is as significant now as it is. I mean, it's been some time. Any of you, maybe only just Peter, has been here a length of time where I have brought forth a budget that is 
challenging for next year and it's not nearly as challenging as some of the previous ones that we've had back in my in my history so I, I can tell you that I will sleep just fine with any of these three options. <clears throat> it is a win-win for all by even refunding because we are obviously capturing a better interest rate overall. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was just going to add um, the bond rating call was last week. To read the preparation and to see the disciplined practices of the district over so many years, to see the financial con um, conditions. Mr. Stovener, we had a couple different things this time. One was a real emphasis on cybersecurity and actions taken by the district. And so for Mr. Stovener to weigh in and provide that background and information for the rating call is great. Everything we've said on rating calls in the past continues or gets stronger. Financial policies have been reviewed and reapproved by the board. So just um, again, tomorrow I think is a hopeful is. some piece of information about, about rating. We remain cautiously optimistic because that's who we are as educators. Um, and we'll see if, if this yeah. is the time finally. But um, again, I don't, I appreciate Dana's concern. Uh, at the same time, um, we are doing the right thing in investing monies towards long lived assets. You know, whether it's the ESSER 3 money, that 80% of it we're hoping can be targeted towards some sort of HVAC projects, which will help offset the future capital funding expenditures Dr. Mihalik was talking about. We continue to make good decisions. I don't think there's a bad decision here. And ultimately, um, I'm hopeful that our financial health gets recognized at some point, um, maybe tomorrow uh, by S&P. So tomorrow, right? <laughs> is, anybody, is anybody uncomfortable, uh, like, just making a decision tonight for Dana. Okay. Yeah, because it has to make the decision by right. So, are you uncomfortable telling us your your what you would vote for? So I'm going to keep, I'm going to do a tally, keeping a tally. So I'm going to make one more statement before okay. we go. All right. Choosing this middle option versus the second option is the equivalent of borrowing more money versus taking it out of our capital fund rate. This middle option is the equivalent of borrowing more money versus withdrawing fund balance to pay for our capital plan next year. I, I just want to say, like, straight up, we are borrowing more money so we don't have to take money out of fund balance next year. Correct. And so that does come down to... I, I know what the different... Yeah. No, I mean, I, absolutely. You can borrow a little more and the yeah. difference isn't big. Yeah. You are essentially paying some issuance costs yeah. to capture that funding up front. But again, it kind of comes down to the comfort level of how much are we comfortable with pulling out a fund balance? And again, it's targeted toward that high school gymnasium project. Are we comfortable with pulling from fund balance? Because if we are, then the absolute answer should, should be shorten the term, <clears throat> should be. Well, if we're not super comfortable with it, but we think that we're headed in that direction, then the hybrid option is the level annual debt savings, or the, yes, the savings over time. <clears throat> I, I, I look at it this way. We're going to have to actually pull from a few different, we're going to have to use a few tools in our tool bo toolbox to do what we have to do. So yes. if we don't take the middle option, we're eliminating a tool that we could use. I think we're still going to pull down fund balance. We'll still have to raise taxes. And, we'll, and this 200 grand will be helpful to have this year. So that's how, so that's fine. I, I, think, and I think that there actually is no bad decision. It's just a decision I'd like to get. So... So I have Kasha in my tally marks here. Kasha and I are in, call, in the middle column up front. Peter and Matt uh, are in the shorten. Yeah. Okay. I, I do have a question. Okay. And if, in this review call tomorrow, can that change any of this picture? You know, if our rating changes, 
do we have access to different products than what's it listed not here? substantially change it, it i can okay. tell you that um okay. it would lessen some of your you know future issuance costs those types of things but it i can tell you with assurance it will not structurally change the savings now again not knowing exactly where the market will be next week um this is kind of what it would look like if the world stopped right this moment um but in the grand scheme of things if they do upgrade us it will not it, it is not going to okay. structurally change this Thanks. so i'm still where i am good okay you're still in, in the all right <laughs> yeah Mr. Another question I have, what, uh, does our fund balance accrue interest at what level, you know, are, are we? It does. And in prior years, it was, it was gaining some good interest. Now I can tell you right now it is not. <laughs> so ben, your I fund balance will never accrue the interest yeah. that you spend on debt. Mm -hmm. Correct. The ratio, we'll the ratio will, will vary. Mm -hmm. Right now that ratio is, is, you know, could be as high as I, 10 to 1. I figure there's something conservative with a low percentage rate compared yeah. to the, the 4 it, or right. some percent. If you're getting 5% yeah. on your fund balance, yeah, it's, it's costing you 10% to borrow. Correct. So yeah. it just, it's never going to. Yeah, yeah. I, figured, I figured it was a, still a big spread. It's always going to cost you more to borrow than the, than the yeah. yeah. Unless so. you've invented the perpetual motion machine. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Campbell, so what say ye? Um, I'm, I'm leaning towards the, um, the option three here um, to you know, shorten the highest net present value savings. Okay. All right. Mr. Same. Moy. Shorten. Yep. Shorten. Okay. Dr. Meyer. We can end up with a tie. Um, I think it's really hard to see both sides. It's a win-win either way. Mm -hmm. So tell yourself that no matter what you say, it's still going to be good. <laughs> you still got to pick a pierogi. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there's no there's no abstaining from this. <laughs> Go for option one. No one's taking that yet. <laughs> okay. All right. I love it. Oh, hold the Chris. Actually, I go with shortening. Oh, this. Okay. So you put the shorten over the goal line there. So shorten it is. Uh, and just, just one more question. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's it's. I just thought of this. So. You know, some of this depends on what we expect the future to do in terms of interest rates, too. Oh my God! So if it's going up, you yeah. know, if it's the, if the cost of debt is forecasted to go up, yeah, then the sixteen thousand dollars <laughs> may cost us more <laughs> than if we take a nap, right? Well, but so I don't know what that looks you like. You just scored you're, a touchdown. I, I understand. You're lobbying that. for. You already got the touchdown. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so and we don't even need Mr. Detolio because. Uh, uh, even if he wanted the upfront, it would still be five to four. So thank you guys. Healthy, healthy conversation. So yep. Dana, I tried. Fantastic. That's right. okay. So okay. we are shortening. Just want to make sure. Yep, that we're that's we are shortening. Again, it is a win-win. It is absolutely terrific for the district and terrific for the community. So I will make sure that PNC Capital Markets, which I believe that they are listening in this evening, as well as our bond council, um, who is also listening in this evening that they are aware um so okay. yes let's okay good i'll be hopeful for tomorrow <laughs> we, ha we have direction thank you guys so now we have to vote on so it. right so yeah. just to recap for those you know so what what we're approving is the motion to refinance yes. our finance director <coughs> has the uh ms kirk has the options within that motion that we're approving that encompass all these scenarios this discussion and what we'll call a straw poll was just to indicate the preference of the board yeah. across that spectrum we've expressed some preference now we formally grant the authority uh to the district and to ms cyphered <sighs> ms kirk <laughs> All the, <laughs> hey we've been around since as long as he mentions two, two, i get to, 20, I get to do that he gave me right, license Dana? on that i don't think anyone's been here since mr <laughs> 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 There you go. <laughs> All those in, fa in favor of the refunding motion say yes. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. All Thank right. you all so much. Good discussion. Uh, all Mark, right. Yep. Uh, yeah, so 404. A few more here. Uh, item 4.04 .04, Motion to approve the engagement letter from Echo Financial Products LLC in the amount of $5,700 to prepare derivative valuations and fair value services required by. The, uh, required by Gatsby. Second. 
Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then uh, item 4.06, a motion to authorize the establishment of a mutual fund sweep account with First Commonwealth Bank as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mark. My, uh, my pleasure. More. Pardon? Uh, 4. Did I miss Oh, wait, okay. I heard 4.06 last. Yeah, please. Oh, what did I miss, Mark? 4.06. Oh, how about oh, that? <laughs> and PSDLA. Mark, your, your penance will be to run right into buildings and grounds if you could. <laughs> okay. All right. I was so excited to say the word sweep. I just was very excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> <laughs> Item 4.05, motion to approve the attached settler attestation between the Pennsylvania School District Liquid Asset Fund and Pine Ridge School District. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item 5.01, motion to approve an agreement with IGS Energy for Electricity Supply Services for Wexford Elementary covering a 36-month term. Second. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I just Dr. Wanna, yeah. yeah, I just want to thank the administration for taking the extra steps to look at what the utility mix is for this uh, agreement because as renewable power gets more available and more affordable, having options to at least look at that in a comparative way is a good thing for us for our sure, sustainability absolutely. work. So I appreciate that. This is a really good price. Yeah. I know. Um, as a resident, we're, I'm paying like 12, 12 cents. No, that includes your delivery. No, it doesn't because I'm on, a, on an alternative energy. Oh, okay. Yeah, a green. With the well, and this, that doesn't include transmission and distribution. Yeah. Th this is not 100% green, though. Right, I, yeah, right. okay, okay. But the 100% green was not that much more, not. Right. It was like, what point? It's a fraction of a cent. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so why are we not going with the green, just for that fraction? We haven't, yeah, we haven't set that as a, I mean, it's a broader conversation, right? Um, yeah, I think that it's, it's a valuable conversation on behalf of all of the board members. I do struggle because there's the whole finance and operations piece of me, and I tend to lean more into the finance bucket, so I struggle if I'm trying to recommend something that is of a higher cost. Um, so again, my recommendation is of the lower cost just because, again, I'm cost-driven, always budget focused um, but as Christine just indicated the the variable difference between the hundred percent green is actually much smaller than I thought that it would be today um, you know so again thank you for bringing up the question because I did not ask that question um, last week when I was kind of going back and forth with them so I was surprised to see that the the variable differential between the two was relatively small um, <clears throat> Well, I so think I think the um, with the amount of money that um, uh, we're not saving today <laughs> because we're shortening our debt, um, I'd rather save it here on the energy now on the electricity. So, what, what I want to say to that is, I, I appreciate your looking. There are contracts that do pop up from time to time for institutions where the green option is the lowest option. Okay. We're close on this one, but not across the line. And so I, asking the question and talking through the, the, the broker that goes and structures these agreements, knowing that that's of interest to us, I think will bring us contracts with that opportunity in the future. Okay. This one, it's close. Not quite there. Not quite there. But, but in it's the about future, 16 I grand, we'll I think, there. that we'll save more here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, this this is the closest, and I yeah. shop, you know, when I shop at home, this is, I, I haven't seen this. This would put me over the edge on a personal account basis, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Yes, um, me too. Yeah. Right, I yeah. understand. Right. right. In the public yeah. interest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I know we have, um, you know, we have sustainability as part of the strategic plan. And one thing we are really good at first is looking at everything, right? Inventorying our entire five, now 10 year capital plan is a function of that. What do we have? Where are we at with what we have? So one thing that occurs to me is creating an inventory of our energy contracts, which you probably are 80, somewhere between 50 and 90% there already, um, but with an eye toward this, when we make decisions, what things come up, um, that would be useful to have as an input to maybe some further discussion. So I do have that, and, and I can say that, you know, in terms of most of our utility agreements, I actually rely on the AIU. Um, and the reason why I do that is because they're able to get pricing because they take all of the usage from all of the districts and they group it together. So when you have a much larger amount of usage, then they can pull the cost down. The difficulty with Wexford is because it falls into that Penn Power region. So it's not significant enough to be part of a consortium. So when we talk about electric, that one kind of sits on its own but I do tend to rely on the AIU for the majority of our other agreements. So that part, in terms of electric, works itself out. Um, for natural gas, it's kind of hit or miss. It can kind of be a little of both. It can be a little bit of grouping up our largest users through the AIU, and then sometimes I have a few outsiders that I've had to kind of negotiate on my own. But I do agree with you. I think that, you know, by asking the questions and by floating it out there, you know, we're, we're basically making ourselves very transparent that this is what's important to us. And if you can pull that cost down for green energy or even a portion of it, you know, we're interested. So if it's gonna be a match or reasonably close, we'll go for it, so. It's just I getting the vendors to um, talk to the right suppliers and know that those contracts are out there. Correct. So. I would just add, uh, Mr. Zimmerman has spent a lot of time with uh, electricity usage. So, correct, you want to share that. But in our May map, one of our figures is segmentation by building, till one hour is used. And he has that for seven years of history. So again, that's an area that he is interested in, has experience in, and is focused on. That is something we are already measuring and reporting every year. And so we're happy to take the next steps with that. <coughs> and, and I would open up with, with respect to the IU, that's a consortium. They absolutely would be, I, I think, and should be open to, hey, members of the, you know, if no one else is asked, we're asking, and maybe you want to poll other districts, because there could be an option for the consortium to create a green bid option. Um, so that's feedback to keep in mind. And, and that's when the larger renewable projects will make contracts at prices that will actually be the standard utility mix price for things. Right. Have we ever priced out or explored solar power, trying that at one building, putting up some, some solar panels and seeing if we get a, a return on investment on that? So I know that one of our reports that we've had through Tower Engineering is currently looking at that, and I want to say it was for the middle school primarily. Um, it, it came up again recently. When we did the parking lot lights to LED, we got a rebate from Duquesne to help oh, yeah, us process that's right. that. And part of that too, they they sent us some um, calculations on installing solar here at the high school. Right now, solar is kind of difficult for us because we have so many roofs that need replaced. So we really don't have any roofs that are you know sitting good with a, a long longevity on them that we can put things on top. But right now, the high school would be one of them. Yeah. So they started doing some calculations. That's, that's what you think about now. The roofs new. You know, then you can time the solar panels to have a lifespan along the time 
you know, Absolutely, the roof. that's what we're looking for. Yeah, or we have plenty of like open space also that we might, you know, do a freestanding uh, instead of the roof, but the roof's a nice, you know, hidden place. But it's also a good learning opportunity for students if we, you know, between our environmental science and our physics and energy you know, and engineering programs to have solar panels where we can m monitor them, chart them, you know, uh, look at their um, usage over, or their, their net generation over time, compare that to electricity rates. It's an excellent, you know, learning lab activity as well as, you know, um, hopefully financial benef financially beneficial. There was also a developer that was um, looking at property within, I believe it was Richland Township, and it was years ago. Um, they were looking at putting in a solar farm, but in order to do so, they needed some of the largest, um, you know, suppliers basically in this region. So we were one of them. They reached out to me, but we would have had to sign an agreement that would essentially indicate that we would be willing to take that solar power at whatever cost that it was going to be. And again, there's that whole finance and operations mm -hmm. piece of me, and I just, I could not, I could not go down that path at all. Um, and I did have several conversations with them because I was interested in the whole concept. Um, and again, I'm all for kind of developing that. But from a governmental entity standpoint, you know, we do have to remain fiscally responsible and we can't just kind of opt into something that was so open-ended. And because they were still in the development phase, but they really needed our agreement to be able to do it, that, that clearly did not happen. So, but we have looked at it in the past. But, but by the way, that's the economic equivalent of just putting your own solar panels on the roof. <laughs> you under, I mean, j just to be perfectly clear, and, and I love being the skeptic on this stuff, that's exactly what it means when you build your own solar farm, is you're committing to buying that regardless of the, you know, how much it produces, whatever. So I, I, I say that as, you know, you're not avoiding that risk by building it around, you're just pretending it's not there. <clears throat> if we really want to go green, I know a township with a windmill just not being used. <laughs> It's a good lesson, right? It's, it's worth noting. I mean, that the, the best laid plans, the best consultants come in and give you a projection on what this will generate. Yeah. And I've had, you know, cocktail napkin conversations with installers who do this nationally with districts, and off the record, you know, they've said, it's Western PA, right? Mm -hmm. Seattle gets more sun than you do. Yeah. This can work, and you won't lose too much, and it'll be nice, but it's not it's not going to save you money don't think putting solar in western now that you know again that's yeah. informal I, i'm willing to look at formal and this is a few years things change so that you have to keep looking at them but yeah you, know, you have to go into it with a healthy sense of skepticism yeah, as, as efficiency yeah. improves and the solar panel costs come down then you got to reach check that calculation every few yep. years yeah, yeah you do yeah. Yeah. and and the one thing about there is a misconception that solar does not make sense in western pennsylvania it actually does the solar panels themselves, their performance is affected by the temperature. And so because we don't have so much sun, there are types of solar panels that are tuned to work in our climate. Just like in Germany, which gets, I think, 40% of its power from, from renewables, mostly solar, um, because they install the right type of panel. Better so those are available on the market here. And um, so I'll, the, the point of all of this is that this is a change that's happening in the market. And the, the cost of renewable power is on a very steep downslide. And we are right at the, the crossover point. And within the next two or three years, it will be hands down a better option for us um, going in the future. So we're having this conversation now. And maybe, maybe in a year, two years, it will be a no-brainer for us. Can, can we ask, and I, I love the easy solution of having someone else worry about figuring out the best way to create that in, in the IU. Um, on an informal basis, asking the IU if anybody else has asked is almost what the question is at this point. Has anybody ever inquired? I'd be curious of, for that as a step right now. Uh, because again, rolling your own is not always, we, we can, if we're buying with 20% of the districts in Allegheny County want to take that on as well, right? That's a significant buy then from a consortium and, and is material to the market, even more so than, than putting a small solar farm, you know, <coughs> wherever we would on district property. Okay. Okay. Good conversation.
Do we still need to vote? I think we do. <laughs> no, we do not. Yeah. Let's <laughs> try. Any other questions or discussions? Again, this is a motion to approve the agreement with IGS Energy for a 36 month term for Wexford Elementary Electrical Supply. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 5.02 Motion to approve the memorandum from the district to the roofing vendor, Rame Inc., allowing them to invoice the district for roofing materials not installed or stored on site if predetermined conditions are satisfied. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Mark. Dr. Meyer. Okay, academic team and <coughs> item 6.01 is an information item entitled Transforming the Future. And uh, I want to hand this off to Dr. Pete. Yeah, I'll kick it off, and uh, we do have a couple slides to share with you tonight. Uh, go ahead to the next one that's shown. Um, again, this is just talking, looking to the future. We've talked to the board about this. We've shared some information with our community. But uh, the first image is around what good organizations do. They're constantly scanning the environment, um, learning from experiences, and looking to make changes and improvement in the future. So the concept here is we experienced last spring. We learned a lot from it. Uh, we have been going through this year, and we have um, think about a tree there are some challenging trees that we've worked through this year but we've also learned a lot and we've experienced some things that we know are good for students and families as a result of, of everything that we've done this year so tonight we're going to share some thinking about short term meaning next year but our eye is always to the future so you can see that um, 2022 20, and beyond that we're thinking there as well I'll go to the next one Everyone's seen this image over and over again. So there was a significant impact on all schools through COVID-19 and everybody reacted and adjusted and made modifications. Again, what do good organizations do? They look to continuously improve and make modifications. So we had this significant, we're calling it this, you know, red star impact. And what do we do as a result of what we learned from this? And that's what we're going to talk about um, tonight. Again, very short term into next school year. I'll go ahead to the next one. So Noel and uh, Kristen are going to take it from here, but we're going to share a little bit of the um, why we're making these recommendations for learning options moving forward, um, how we're collaborating with others. You've heard the concept of leadership councils in different areas uh, with our healthcare team, with our diversity, equity, inclusion team. So similar concept here with thinking to the future and how we're gathering information from our families and our students about what they're thinking about so we can make those very much short-term decisions looking at the 21-22 school year. So Noel's gonna pick it up from there. Go to the next slide, Sean. So Dr. P talked a little bit about the, the, the why here, but um, we've touched on this before, and you know, COVID-19 has, uh, has presented us with a, a generational challenge. And you know, through that, we've learned in developing our, our virtual model that um, you know, the, the fact is, is that some students have thrived by all measures. And we want to continue to understand and, and recognize that, that it's a viable option for some families and that they um, do wish to continue with that. Um, we also have to talk and think about the competitive environment that we're in now because that has changed as well and we need to be able to respond to that um, and if you skip to the next slide Sean I just wanted to touch on this real quick we you know we talk about our MVV all the time but this has been in place for I think six years now with some minor tweaks and it amazes me as to how it continues to be relevant I mean it, specifically now thinking about how you know learning is different for different people and that it happens inside and outside of the classroom uh, it's no more um, relevant than when talking about our virtual instruction and in the, in the models that we had to develop for this year um, in response to COVID. So go ahead, John. We've highlighted here in red, uh, you know, our educational model continuum and also the, the fact that we are 
focusing on transforming uh, our, our, our educational model for the future uh, as two of our six key initiatives. Um, and if you go ahead and skip to the next. This is, this is just the how. And as we approach any key initiative, we want to ensure that we have uh, you know, gathered the voice of uh, as many, as many uh, stakeholders uh, within the district as possible. And that includes school board members, senior leadership team, building level administrators, uh, our teacher leaders, you know, with the ALCs and the, and the BLTCs. Um, we also want to consider other members of our staff, students, uh, parents and community members, and you see the breakdown on the right of uh, what we wish to uh, you know, gather as, as, as members to uh, ensure that we have as much voice uh, representation as possible. And to talk a little bit more about our STARS is uh, Dr. Jeff. So in thinking through this, we've talked previously too that we aren't going to see a huge leap overnight um, into this transformational future that we want to look back and say, wow, look how far we've come. So at this point, we're taking our A to Z continuum where we're taking small strategic steps um, towards that future. And so taking the lessons that we've learned, um, the interest from folks, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, um, and thinking about what changes we want to see for next year and then building upon that in future years. So we're in the little red star moment uh, with the big red star to come. And of course, continuous improvement is just a part of what we do. So we'll continue to see that. On the next slide, you'll actually see the input from the family. So of everybody that was in our um, virtual learning model, so 800 students, if you think about that, um, in that learning model, 75% of those families responded indicating their interest. And we had designed that intentionally as a Likert scale so that we could see about what they were thinking. This was a non-binding survey at that point um, just to get a feel for where they would be. So you can see that um, in terms of the strongly agree or agree that the very likely somewhat likely category, we have about 72 kids who are thinking that they're going to be planning to come back. So that's K through 12, um, 72 being vastly different than the number of students that we have now. And even if 100% of our um, students in that model were to have responded, we would be projecting around 100 students, um, K through 12 for the following year. And they are sprinkled somewhat throughout um, the pattern um, of the grade level. So we've looked at that um, and what it would take for each. So despite the number uh, that are interested, it doesn't change the why. We know we need to provide this um, for our families and students who are thriving. Um, and so we are now just looking at leveraging that leadership council, the stakeholder input that we have, as well as the, the thinking that we are engaged in currently to decide how that will look um, for the coming year. And so we had previously given you um, on the next slide an indication of what we were thinking. So we envision 95% or more of the, at the time, right, of our students when we designed this model being in the in-person traditional learning environment. We still see a small amount who are going to be on that right-hand side where we're um, envisioning that they are at home participating virtually and it's a matter of now looking at which courses are delivered with a dedicated um, teacher in a synchronous manner and which will be conducted with a high flex where they're removing into the room um, and that would be for electives or special area courses or also having some asynchronous options. So what we're now in the process of looking at is how do we staff this in a manner that might be a little bit more creative and so we're going to talk to the council about that. Um, continually keeping in mind things that are in the center there uh, within the red box so that we can work and operate within um, a model that we think is viable for the future but takes a step in that direction towards providing this option beyond this year where it was a necessity from a pandemic standpoint um, for certain families. So on the next slide um, you'll see that we are asking families when they complete the next uh, survey to select and stay so they will be within that model um, for the coming year and what families can anticipate as the timeline slide um, that follows is that we are asking families, parents, to weigh in again in early summer as to what they're envisioning for their individual children throughout our model. That'll give us a little bit more of the information that we need to labor in with what we know to be staff interest from the survey that we had put out previously, um, as well as the indications that we'll have from our leadership council as we move forward. So that's sort of at the moment, obviously, as we continue to convene with our Transforming the Future Leadership Council, uh, we'll have continuous updates there. Thank you. It's a significant addition. It really is. So. I appreciate the update very much. 
Dr. Campbell. Item 7.01 is the purchase of end user, de user devices. We have a motion to approve the purchase of uh, 1,150 Dell Student 2 in 1 uh, tablet laptop Chromebooks and 120 Dell Teacher Latitude 2 in 1 window laptops for a total cost of $499,999. And just to note that the original cost of this uh, earlier this year was about five five hundred and ninety five thousand and mr stobener was able to get uh, that price reduced by about ninety five thousand through negotiation so mark you just got half your bond savings right there ninety five thousand <laughs> uh, back in the budget for next year awesome. thank you sean uh, second. <laughs> is there any discussion? Other discussion good job mr stobener all those in favor say yes yes, yes. yes. opposed Motion carries. Just quick mention, Mr. Stobener put a public content uh, information here, but this sort of leaps us forward in the one-to-one -one concept. So next year we'll have K with iPads. Those will be redeployed from current kindergarten to next year's kindergarten. Uh, Chromebooks in the hands of first graders, but all the way through eighth grade. And so we're moving towards a cycle of that one-to-one. -one. That was a question on our strategic plan. We've sort of backed into it through COVID, but we're seeing the benefits of that. I think a challenge to us will be understanding when the computer as a tool is not best and ensuring that we're not utilizing them because they're, we have them in front of us, but when it applies to the learning goals of a particular class, when it makes sense for the learning activity, and we want to make sure that our program balances both of those things. But this is an awesome sort of big leap in where we were with considering one-to-one um, -one concept at Pine Ridge. Uh, item 7.02 um, is for the 2021-2022 discipline code, a motion to approve the attached uh, discipline code for the 2021-2022 school year. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And item 7.03, uh, the 2021 2022 handbooks. Uh, we have a motion to approve the uh, student handbooks as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? Um, minor thing, there's a few corrections in some of these. Um, I think it was the high school one, the library link doesn't work in the, um, in, in the uh, uh, table of contents, uh, the link to the right page. And the Eden Hall one, I think there's some font issues in the, uh, um, in the table of contents as well. So minor fixes, whoever is in, can edit that. But uh, otherwise, they look great. Did you pass those along, Ben? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll write it down. Who should I email to? Please. Kristen. Okay. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Ben. Dr. Mihalik. Thank you. Item 8.01 is a motion to approve the personnel items as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item eight. And with that, I do want to. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I do want to pause and uh, congratulate Mr. Salapak on his appointment as director of athletics. You've gone from high school assistant principal to director of athletics. That is frying pan to the fire in anyone's book, <laughs> um, <clears throat> especially in in Pine Richland. We appreciate your interest. It is a high interest, high visibility, critically important position to parents and families in this district. Uh, so we really appreciate you taking it on. I will, on a personal note, did take a look at your resume. You know it's internal, uh, but we did see your resume, and there are a couple of surprising things on there. The first one is Allegheny College has a football team. Uh, that was very surprising. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Salapek being the team captain was the least surprising part about that, uh, by the way. So. But congratulations. Thank you very much. I'm so excited for the opportunity. Um, on behalf of my family, my wife, and two little girls, thank you all so much. I am eager to get started to work with our student athletes. 
our parents and the community at large. Um, just coming from an athletic background, um, you know, within my family, I'm excited that the opportunities that I've experienced as an athlete um, at the collegiate level, also my role as a teacher, as a coach, and most recently as a building administrator, I feel like I'm prepared for the challenge and, and ready for the opportunity. So I can't wait to get started, and thank you all so much. I'm honored to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Chime in real quick. Um, I think what most excites me about working with Mr. Salapek in this role is with him, the first thing always that comes to his mind is students. Uh, again, it's what we do, we, it seems almost silly to say that, but it's a fact and it's not always the case with everybody um, that you work with, but uh, very much a student centered leader and looking forward to what he's able to do uh, with and through this community so congratulations yeah agreed and challenging role but great opportunity that goes hand in hand and when you have the right person uh, pursuing a chance you embrace that that's an opportunity to to enjoy to struggle through to engage and uh, I think that's the most exciting part one of the things that Mr. Salpeck has done since he's been at Pine Richland is earn the respect of those who he works with. And that's even when not coming to agreement or, or having conflict within a situation. And so, uh, again, uh, all of the comments have, have been accurate. I also want to share, we had four retirements on tonight's personnel list. And this is that time of year when we have the opportunity to celebrate those, in some cases, who have devoted a lifetime, their full career, uh, to the students and community of Pine Richland and so again, we have retirements here. We see them at different points at this time of year, but we wanna say thank you um, and much appreciation for the impact that they've had on students in so many different ways. And we see that specifically with this set of retirements. So again, congratulations to those folks as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So item 8.02, is a motion to approve the first reading of miscellaneous policies as listed below and attached. Second. <clears throat> is there any discussion? So I just wanted to say that um, under the student wellness, and it's more of a, um, to kind of highlight uh, that um, one of the uh, items that was in there is about promoting um, physical activity and uh, walking, biking to school, and that the district does have uh, bike racks that um, Mike, Dr. Pasquinelli has helped to um, secure earlier in the school year, at the beginning of the school year. At the high school, we have a bike rack, and we also have one at the middle school, and uh, to help, and then we also, through um, the walking path, that was uh, a kind of a joint, um, effort between the uh, township and um, the, the district um, on the St. Barnabas property and with, with St. Barnabas as well. Uh, now we have our walking path. Um, so that's the beginning of really promoting more physical health and wellness in our students. So I just wanted to highlight that to the community and uh, I know I see our kids running on it for um, cross country and, and uh, I see community members out there every day uh, walking on it. And I did raise the question and it was uh, posed about um, who is to maintain that path in the winter time. And um, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, I know that uh, through, um, uh, actually Barb, uh, Ms. Williams communicated that you had spoken with the township supervisor or with, or with a member of the township. Could you? Sure, um, <laughs> so Mr. Kropakis is the, uh, the code enforcement officer for Pine Township. Uh, when I spoke to him, he said that they currently don't maintain any of the walking trails within Pine Township during the winter. It's, they use it at your own risk. Uh, but he said that that doesn't mean it's off the table or that's something that we would like to have. He said it would just uh, require a formal um, ask on our part and that they would consider it as far as maintenance for the winter season. And I passed Peter using it, on, uh, riding his bike on it on the way to the meeting tonight. So. 
halfway so yeah. you you would you would run into some connection issues so even if you, you know so at the other end where do you end up so we could we could make sure we have a nice connection walking into into the school district um, on the other side on Treesdale you you're connecting now to golf cart path which are which are not maintained and outside of what the township would do um, and I know on the other side you know coming coming from Logan Road or coming from Pinecrest, which are two important connections that, that people connect to from here through those neighborhoods, um, those generally go <clears throat> dormant, if you will, for some time and, you know, with the snow. So um, it's worth thinking about. But right. I, I don't know if it's just specifically the school district to be uh, questioning that. Maybe it's as a being a community member as well. Putting these this walk these walking trails in eventually, you know, as as we look into the future, there there needs to be some thought to maintenance. You know, people who use it, uh, or they do use it. And I saw them walking on the ice, and it was icy. Um, so and it's, it's so that was just a, a thought. Um, uh, so yeah, it could take some future. could take some additional coordination. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, if there's a local trail maintenance organization in the North Hills that works on, I don't know if they work in North Park, you know, trying to find some volunteers to do those projects, it's always a good thing. And lots of scouts also like to get involved with that type of work as well. Too. A vote. All those in favor of the first miscellaneous batch policy reading say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 8.03 is an information item for board consideration at the May planning meeting. There will be a motion to approve in, in, in accordance with policy 109.1 .1, library resources, the weeding of Wexford Elementary Library resources as attached. Second. Oh, there's, it's just information. Oh. And item 8.04 is um, a notice that a staff services committee meeting was held prior to this combined April meeting tonight. I don't know if there's any report out on that. Mr. Glickman gave a great overview. The, the slide deck does a nice job of capturing the process. So I think for those who were not able to attend the committee meeting, if they were to review the slides, they're going to get a good feel for uh, the process of staffing at, at Pine Ridge. But it wasn't as nice as Mr. Glickman's presentation. No, Mr. No, Mr. Moy. Item 9.01, this is for board consideration at the next meeting. This is a motion to approve a renewal agreement with Sodexco for a guaranteed financial return of $100,875 for the fiscal year of 21, 2021 and 2022. Thank you. It's just information, so. Item 10.01 is the third and final reading of Bash Policy 000, Local Board Procedures. Second. <clears throat> is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And I think with this, Ms. Williams is going to roll out so some comprehensive language changes, um, which sh will probably take me till the end of my next term to get straight. So if I still keep calling them committees and committee chairs, forgive me. <clears throat> <clears throat> item 10.02 is a discussion item for the board uh, to discuss a spring communication to stakeholders. I've attached a matrix um, that Rachel uh, began developing for us and uh, Christine and I have been updating periodically uh, with all the sort of touch points, meetings that we participate. These here in DeWitt 
uh, but also other committees and opportunities to speak or be present, PTO meetings, leadership councils, etc. The desire to have a spring message actually goes back almost two years. And uh, you may recall, you may not, it was March and April 2020 uh, when people were getting, you know, I think three or four emails a day from Rachel. Uh, just kidding. But, you know, we had communication overload. So we didn't feel at that time that a board message would stick out. We were all in sort of crisis mode. Um, but I did actually mark my calendar, uh, which is great because I would never remember on my own, to go back and take a look. So if I recall correctly, the impetus at the time or thought was tentatively around budget. It is usually an area of focus, certainly an area of our focus now. It's always an area of high interest in the community. And we can draft something, <coughs> Christine and I have a pretty good system down for drafting stuff and circulate it to the board. But I want to offer the opportunity to discuss other topics or um, what about the budget maybe we would want to highlight as well. So I'll just throw that very open-ended. give a little more into this so in terms of budget <laughs> in terms of budget right um, I do want to get a better sense from the board about how much we want to talk about we, we can talk about the fund balance and the anticipated use of fund balance so far thus far the board has indicated because we're talking about long-term assets that we are very comfortable with using fund balance right accrued savings to pay for that. We've also indicated to the extent we've said anything about a tax increase that this year does not feel like something we want to do. So these are pretty important things that I would typically mention. Um, and I want to make sure there's comfort around those. So I'll say that. There'll be opportunity to, to reflect later. But I think the long-term financial planning is what's most significant. So how have we moved in terms of debt service or outstanding debt? Outstanding debt over my tenure is uh, tremendous. Fund balance, the inventory and rationalization of our approach to capital expenditure, the long-term investments we've made, field six, et cetera, and how we look at that. I think those things get you quickly past the, this is what we're doing in the next month or two in the budget, and serve as a great opportunity uh, to talk about some of the great long-term planning that's going on in this room that isn't always so exciting. So that's maybe what I was thinking if that works for everyone. Just to chime in a few other ideas, um, you know, as we just mentioned about the one-to-one -one initiative that kind of sort of got pushed onto us via COVID, um, but the fact that we've been able to use the first two rounds of federal funding to help offset those costs for the technology devices to get us to that one-to-one -one point from K to eight, that's significant. There are many school districts that are facing large amounts of federal funding, which is great, but what happens is at the end of that, that's gonna create an operational hole for them. So what we're trying to do, and we are being very intentional about strategically using our federal funds that are coming through for long-lived assets. So we have funneled the first two rounds, almost three rounds really, of, um, of those grants in terms of technology devices. For another round of funding, that's where we're looking at some of those HVAC projects and that might be either next fiscal year or it might be the following fiscal year. But again, you know, we're trying to make sure that that is routed toward those assets that are long term. So things like that, um, the virtual academy is huge. Um, so these are all types of different things that we can highlight. So whether or not they might be budget highlights, they're also district highlights that fall into how we're managing funds to pay for those. Just a couple of thoughts. So when you mentioned the virtual academy, um, also uh, that what we were able to do this year was still within budget not pulling from fund balance at all so uh, yeah virtual 
had any long term substance use. Yeah. All of that was pulled, was um, from our operating budget. I was just going to endorse the idea of the conversation as a, a, a very good idea um, because there's a lot, there can be the opportunity for a lot of misconception about what's involved in that type of longer range thinking. You really do have to see the um, position of the district over multiple years to really make some of the smarter choices, I think, going forward and, and having a lot of open and transparent conversation about that, I think, is, serves everyone's best interest so that we know that we're making decisions what's in the best interest of our students and our families here, and, and the staff as well of the school. We might even think of embedding a link to the, the chart that Dana has with like the HVAC, the big capital projects that we have. That's good. Yeah. That's a real, it's a colorful, but okay. it's really, it's, Well, uh, I just caution us: if we pack this too much, yeah. then <laughs> it won't if I started be, by now, I get a two thousand right. words by nine thirty, <laughs> and and I'll and I don't know the answer to this, but I know where it's going. R Rachel, approximately what percentage of our emails are opened on a mobile device? There, we're almost at like fifty-fifty. You would yeah. think it would be yeah. higher on mobile devices, yeah. which, uh, <laughs> but it's pr about fifty-fifty. Yeah. And that's I think that's actually lower than I would have guessed. Yeah, but. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, we we it's do want this to be read, right? Three to 350 words, one graphic, two hyperlinks is probably about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since it's Monday and Tuesday's the bond rating, um, right? maybe we can lead with that. Yeah. If, we, if we get there. Uh, Let's, well, right. Because yeah. there's no more holistic measure of fiscal health than that, so we'll see if that comes through. Still helpful. Yeah, cautious optimism. <laughs> This is uh, in the board's entire voice, so we'll, we'll come back uh, to board members with drafts. And Peter, I forget, did we put each board member's name on the letter, or is it just from the president? Uh, we, we actually, I know the first one we did all the names, we did. Uh, and yeah. we talked about the second one, we did, so okay. we can continue to do that. Well, I think it's important because... Yeah. Uh, I, I want everybody to know who's on this board because I'm proud to serve with you guys. And I am not at all pleased with the distortion of the truth that is out there by a, a, a vocal small minority. And I think we do, if we're going to use this communication, I think it also should just affirm um, our, our kids first approach, um, our transparency. I can't, I can't even imagine how someone could listen to Dr. Mueller's message, watch this meeting, and conclude that we're not transparent. It just baffles the mind. So I just want to—I want to—I want to get the truth out there, and this is one way for us to do that. Absolutely. All right. Item 10.03 is a reminder of the joint governance meeting on May 17th. My machine's a little laggy, so I'm trying to read it across the room, but let me see if I can catch up here. There you go. You know, last time I took my glasses off at the beginning of the meeting, Ms. Williams caught me right away not mentioning the uh, executive session, so I'm gonna. <coughs> uh, the joint governance meeting, the topic is diversity, equity, and inclusion on May 17th. Item 10.04 is a public information item to schedule an educational model transformation and transition meetings and the board senior leadership team summer retreat. Um, two different things, so one on June 7th, the other one for August 2nd at 6 p.m. And finally, 10.05 is just a public information item that we will be starting the June 21st, 2021 regular board meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, for everyone's convenience and to ensure we get out before sunset, which is the longest day of the year <laughs> uh, because we don't have a committee meeting on that That's date. Right. So we're changing it. Does that work for everybody? Okay. 
yeah. I, I want to see the sunset, yeah. It's going to feel like 3 o'clock in the afternoon when we start at 6 here. But we walk along the Warren Dale Bay Bridge. That's right. That's right. Maybe, yeah, Christine, maybe you'd like to join me walking home that evening? Okay. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. All right, item 11.01, 11.01, reports. Do any board members or members of the administration have additional reports to share? No, um, probably we have a board, there's a board meeting I just want to mention the elevate part of our decide model. I think uh, Mark tonight shepherding us through the straw poll on the financing was uh, <laughs> excellent use of the decide model. I want to elevate you for, you know, going through that exercise with us and, and uh, you know, letting us have that lively discussion and, and uh, give our input on that issue. Well, thank you, Dr. King. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just a couple items from the Allegheny Intermediate Unit. You should have all received ballots uh, for the Board of Directors elections. The elections and convention would have typically taken place this week. Uh, due to COVID, this is our second year with um, online, well, not even online, they're mail-in ballots. So please take advantage of that. Send in your ballots. <clears throat> I did want to highlight something that took place back in March, which was the legislative policy form which the IU holds every year. This year's virtual form was a real success, and I think we may hold that venue over. Uh, it just allowed for a greater degree of participation, uh, both from school directors throughout Allegheny County, uh, but even legislators, I think we think, found it easier to participate. And people have become so comfortable with that. If you had tried to do that a year ago, it just, it would have gotten in the way of actual dialogue. But really now it's become so comfortable. The resulting dialogue was fantastic. It was a lesson. It was such a difference from watching the evening news in terms of legislators who had real policy disagreements about education and were we speaking, speaking respectfully um, and were, were talking about the facts and uh, kept that tone elevated with the public interest in all their hearts forefront. Um, it was a fantastic lesson. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we hope to repeat that going forward. And finally, I, I will mention our strategic planning uh, committee. Our process is well underway. Uh, we are on track to you know, have a revised strategic plan for the IU uh, to start the school year of July 1st. Uh, a lot of hard work is going in by all the stakeholders at this point. So more, more to come on that as well. Any other reports at this point? Ms. Williams, do we have any visitors in the waiting room? Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, the board is going to adjourn to executive session to discuss a student personnel matter. Have a good evening. <laughs>